Hey guys, today we're going to start talking about color mixing. I was asked to cover how I mix my custom paint colors. Now, if I'm being honest, my method of mixing is fairly random. I usually just lay out a few colors that I want to work with along with my micas and then start going for it. That type of method isn't for everyone. Some people learn a bit better when they have some sort of guidelines to follow. So, I got to work studying and learning as much about color as possible. I've been really interested in the science and history of color lately. The mechanics behind how we actually see color and how colors have changed throughout history. There's a great book called The Secret Lives of Color that is a really good starting point if you're interested in the history and significance of certain colors. It takes a look at how some pigments were discovered and the different ways that they've been used along the way. I'm not going to get into every single theory on color, but there are a few points here and there that I will be touching on. When you start working with mica and interference, you're working more with a light mixing theory. Pigments work on the color mixing theories. So in my quest to be more efficient with my custom color mixes, I'm going to try to cover what I'm learning along the way. I have a bit of information to share with you guys, but I'm constantly learning more each time I start reading. So today we are going to start with something basic. I want to talk about the, some of the relevant information you can find on paint bottles. A lot of you may be just starting out, so you're grabbing colors that look awesome in the bottle. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, and it works perfectly well. Once you start getting into mixing paints together, though, knowing what the symbols and codes mean can come in handy. When you look at a bottle of paint, there are going to be several different symbols. When mixing, the most important ones you're go are going to be the transparency and the color index code. While there are other factors to consider when you buy paint, I'm going to focus on those two elements today. Most acrylic paints are going to have either a square denoting its transparency or it will have an actual swatch of the color painted over a series of black and white stripes. When looking at a paint that is using the square system, a fully colored square will denote an opaque color a half-colored square means semi-opaque, and a non-colored square means that the paint is transparent. Opaque paint is going to have the strongest hiding power. It does not allow light through, so anything that is painted over will not show through. So, if you had a pencil mark on your canvas that you wanted to be sure disappears, you would need to use an opaque paint to achieve this. Semi-opaque paint allows some light through, meaning some other colors may show. Transparent paint allows the most light through. This means that while the color will still appear, it has a high chance of not being distinguishable if used with opaque and semi-opaque paints in the same pore. The second thing that you should pay attention to the next time you look at your paints is the color index code. This is a set of letters and numbers that you find on acrylic paints. They are located in different places on different brands, but they will start with the letter P. The letter P stands for pigment. It's followed by the letter of the color group of that pigment. They're pretty straightforward. Y is yellow, G is green, V is violet, and so on. Ones that may trip you up at first are BR for brown and BK for black. This letter is going to show you which color group that pigment is agreed to be part of. The numbers that follow the letters refer to the exact pigment in that color group. There are websites where you can search the color index for free. So if you want to know exactly which pigments you're working with, you can type it in and get more information about it. When you start looking at the color index codes, you may notice that some tubes will have a singular color code while others contain multiple. Singular codes indicate that that is the only pigment that's being used to make that tube of paint. When you use paints that have multiple codes on them, you have to consider how those pigments are going to interact with any of the colors that you mix it with. You run into multiple pigment codes a lot when dealing with paints that are considered to be a hue. So take cadmium hues, for instance. If you look, they will always be a mixture of pigments. 
Cadmium is now considered to be toxic, so in an effort to move away from that, companies make blends of other pigments to get the closest possible match to the original color. Hues are typically used when the original pigment has been labeled as too dangerous or too expensive to use in the quantities needed. You may also notice that some colors actually have the same pigment code, but they're different names. These paints are using the same base pigment, but the way the chemical is processed differs, resulting in different colors. There are several great color mixing guides out there if you're interested in doing a more in-depth study. I have found that trial and error make great teachers. Having a good basic understanding of the color wheel and how colors interact with each other will help out tremendously. In the next video, I will go over a little bit of basic color theory ideas that will come in handy. There are tons of resources out there on color theory, so I'm not going to go into too much depth. I just want to touch on a couple of things that will help you when you mix. So for now, Take a look at your pigments. See how many of your colors are pure pigments versus being a combination. What is the transparency of the pigments? Go ahead and check out some of the pigment codes online. You can learn a lot from that little code. Knowing the base pigments that you're working with will help you mix more pure looking colors. Again, it is not 100% necessary to know color theory backwards and forwards to start mixing colors. Trial and error work great and you learn a lot along the way. I use this method more often than not. We all learn the basic color wheel in grade school. It's one of the first things we learn. By building on that knowledge, we are better able to transform the colors that we are using. With that, I'm going to finish this video by asking you guys to comment and let me know if there's anything specific that you would like for me to cover in this series. As I said, I will be touching on some color theory next video. I'm going to try my best to explain some different ideas about how we view color and light. I'm not a scientist, so the information will be basic, but I hope to give you guys a great starting point if you want to learn more. So let me know below if you'd like for me to cover anything specific or if you have any questions about today's video. I'll see you guys next time. Bye!